And we're really happy today to um, welcome members of the board of the Africa Economic Research Consortium. Um, they've been having meetings in Washington, and we thought this was a great opportunity um, to take advantage of that and uh, give a little profile of a network that I actually am not that familiar with, and I imagine uh, others in Washington may not be that familiar with, but I think is really worth knowing something about. Um, the consortium aims to build a, a cadre of African researchers that really can help guide African economic policymakers and managers in, in, in planning and, and, and strategy. And I think the importance of the network really is in generating a, a body of empirical evidence um, on Africa's economic challenges, in developing a culture of um, policy relevant research, and equally important, a culture of evidence-based policy making. So um, really that building that, that bridge between uh, a academia and research and policy makers. It's a challenge everywhere. The think tank phenomenon is, is not that prevalent in Africa. Um, here in this neighborhood, if you throw a stone, you're gonna hit a think tank. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I think in some ways, AERC has been well ahead of its time. It's now in its 25th year. Um, it's been doing this very successfully. Um, and we're eager to hear how it's gonna move going forward. I mean, issues and uh, global issues, technologies, the kinds of uh, uh, deals that need to get made and the kinds of problems uh, African countries are facing in the, in the coming 50 years, and I think we'll hear about it, that, are becoming increasingly complex. And research networks like this one really can extend the capacity of, um, of African governments to understand these. And, and very few policymakers have the time or inclination to go into the deep, deep analysis. But I think research consortiums like this can play a huge role. So we have a great, uh, a great panel. I mean, if you look at the board members, it's a pretty impressive list. Um, but we have a representative here, a representative sample here. Um, we have with us uh, the, um, let's see, I'll, we'll, I'll go in order of, of which they're gonna speak. Professor Lemma Senbet, who is the executive director of the Re research consortium. He's the William Mayer Chair uh, and Professor of Finance at the Smith School uh, of the University of Maryland in College Park, so he's a local, uh, director of the Center for Financial Policy. Uh, he's been, f his work is focused largely on corporate finance, international finance, uh, financial contracting. He's been an advisor for the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the UN, and, and many others. He's, he's written prolifically on issues of, uh, of finance uh, and has uh, equally important, I think, helped mentor a new generation of economic um, researchers going forward, many of whom hold prestigious uh, positions now at, at universities here in the U.S. Um, with us also, we have uh, uh, Professor Mtuli Nkube, uh, he's chairman of the board and director of large of the AERC. Uh, he's also vice president and chief economist with the African Development Bank, where he's responsible for knowledge management, uh, economic strategy, and he supervises the departments of research, uh, development, uh, department of statistics, um, and the African Development Institute. He holds a PhD in economics, uh, specializing in mathematical finance from Cambridge University. Uh, I won't go into all the degrees because we have a highly educated group here. So, um, uh, and it, it was, he's, he's taught at the London School of Economics, uh, at WITS, um, and uh, at, uh, let's see where else. <laughs> Okay, well, you get the picture, Cambridge, you get it. Uh, finally, we have Professor um, Benno Ndulu, who's a director at large with AERC, and is governor of the Central Bank of Tanzania, uh, where he was appointed in 2008. He, too, has a, a long pedigree, a, a PhD in economics from Northwestern, and I think uh, early in the 1980s, um, he worked at the University of Dar es Salaam as a professor, held a series of seminars there that eventually helped kind of inform the reforms that took place in the 1980s and began to turn Tanzania around. Um, he, uh, he, he then had a long career in the, at the World Bank in the macro, as lead economist with the macroeconomic division. Uh, and and uh, Professor Ndulu was one of the people that really helped found and stand up the AERC. So he's seen the evolution um, over the years. So 
here we have a, a great group of people who had their base in the you know strong academic setting, but have really kept that focus on and 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 moved towards policy relevance and and policy making, influencing uh, national policy makers and and international as well. So we're going to start with Professor Senbet to tell us a little bit about the structure and and the the objectives of the. Um, Consortium. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, uh, I wish to thank CSIS and uh, Jennifer Cook for uh, hosting the ARC board at this wonderful facility in partnership with uh, USAID. Now, uh, we have just celebrated our 25th year anniversary. 25 years ago, uh, policies in Africa were made on heuristics, judgments, and ideologies and very little uh, base re relating to uh, evidence base and rigor. So ARC actually came into existence to fill that gap. And uh, what I would like to do is actually um, talk about a couple of very innovative mechanisms that the ARC employed at the initial stages, and then how progressively moved into other uh, initiatives. Um, beginning with uh, research, um, 25 years ago, they came up with uh, five separate teams. And what goes on is that we get researchers from around the continent, at some place in Africa, because it's a pan-African organization, and then assemble these researchers in five separate rooms. They present research in various stages of development. And then they review each other. And we call that the peer review mechanism. And over time, uh, this peer review mechanism be, has been monitored by resource individuals from around the globe. In fact, uh, that's how I, I, I got engaged with the ARC. Then uh, the uh, collaboration amongst researchers who have actually gone through this peer review mechanism and resource people from around the globe to actually work on big issues that could not be conducted by one individual. Uh, issues on climate change, food security, and so on. This collaborative framework then became a foundation for in innovating collaborative training programs. So we have collaborative masters uh, in economics. We have collaborative PhD program also in economics, where uh, thesis presentations are actually done in the same peer review uh, biannual uh, workshop. Now, with reference to this biennial workshop, which actually occurs twice a year, attracting the largest contingents of economists from Africa, we had a variety of side meetings, one of which is known as plenary conference. This is a conference based on a contemporary topic of policy interest and based on thought leaders from anywhere around this globe. And with the purpose of actually exposing our researchers to best practices. Now, uh, we have been in existence for 25 years, which means that we can actually show and, and witness some long-term payoffs from capacity building, because the business of ARC is capacity building to advance research and training to inform economic policies. So one of the consequences of capacity building uh, is actually at this podium. You have uh, Metuli Nkube, who is uh, chief economist and vice president of the African Development Bank. Beno Ndulu was, uh, was the second, actually, executive director of the ERC. And eight to nine other governors of central banks who have actually gone through this program, who have been nurtured. And actually, you find ARC uh, alumni everywhere in the continent. Uh, I was mentioning today at the board meeting, I didn't quite appreciate it until once I stepped into the research department of the Kenya Central Bank. And I was actually looking for data. And at that time, I was not in this position. And I find that every researcher there, every employee there has an ARC stamp, basically ARC, including the governor of Central Bank of Kenya. So. Um, it's an organization which has become actually a true African success story. 
What I told you was the long-term consequences of what ARC has achieved over time, but we also mix that with short-term um, approaches and mechanisms where we take the collaborative research, as I mentioned earlier, and disseminate that to policymakers. We have senior policymakers consisting of governors of central banks, ministers of finance, in the same room, dialoguing on the collaborative research. And we do that for two purposes, one of which is that we are introducing what has been researched to policymakers. And at the same time, we're getting feedback from them, which will in turn actually help us design or redesign what we're doing. And so we have senior policy seminars at the, at the continental level. And then uh, as a result of these papers that have been developed, uh, we combine those with country case studies. And from that, we identify issues of particular concern to particular countries. And then we actually conduct national workshops. Um, so and apart from um, long-term consequences, we also have a, I can, we can actually point to a variety of uh, collaborative projects which have more direct interface with policy. For instance, there was a project on poverty uh, and, and growth uh, syndrome uh, led by one of our global resource persons, Eric Torbeck of Cornell University, which actually was used to inform poverty reduction strategies adopted by many African countries. Now, the other is I have a friend, uh, Gail Martin. She's from the World Bank. What the World Bank and, and the African uh, Economic Research Consortium actually partnered on this highly successful project called Service Delivery Indicators. And uh, that has been actually inaugurated in a number of countries, Kenya, uh, I think the next one is Nigeria. So th those are just a couple of ex examples uh, in terms of this interface between research and policy. Now, I, I want to be brief now, moving forward, this is an organization that has done so much, that has created so much value, but it is poised to get and move to the next level of excellence. We are going to uh, capitalize on advancing technology to integrate technology in all of ARC's operations and also these collaborative tra training programs to take full advantage of blended learning and, and so on. And, and then the whole area of communication. The organization has become so complex. So you have guys who research not communicating with training, and so we're actually creating synergy across various products and services uh, of, of the ARC. We are also going to get out of the old public domain mentality of what we've been doing to get more robust engagement with the private sector. And, and then I'm going to end here. Thank you. Fantastic, that's great. We're gonna turn to you, Professor Ndula, was that the plan? Oh. No? Okay. Okay, we're going to turn to Professor Ndube. Um, I think you'll you'll talk a little bit about w what's the what's the agenda that's out there now in, in in on the economic scene in Africa, looking for what are the big challenges. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for listening to us the, this afternoon. I must say that I'm I'm thrilled and uh, most honored and privileged to to be the chair of the board of the ARC. Really, a truly uh, successfully uh, successful uh, African story. If I can just pick up from where Lema left, which is about having the, we, we, we've got the, the ARC alumni everywhere in Africa and also globally in institutions here, of policy making here in Washington, in the World Bank, the IMF and other institutions, they, they, are, they are there and they are, they are making their, their, their mark. It is no coincidence, no coincidence I repeat, that Africa weathered the financial crisis so well. We had policymakers of quality at the central bank of quality in the ministers of finance, instituting those ne necessary uh, counter cyclical measures to, to deal with the crisis as, as, as it came, uh, uh, making sure that they're able to use the, the fiscal and monetary shock absorbers to absorb uh, the, that shock. Uh, and I think that the ARC had something to do with the quality of those policymakers and, and, and their action. Africa has been growing at what, 5.2% in the last 10 years. Uh, and again, it is the same policymakers who have delivered this growth in terms of guiding uh, their economies. Of course, I'm not saying that it is all macroeconomic management. There are other factors, you know. I don't think the, the, the policymakers are responsible for the degree of urbanization. Maybe they are that is taking place. The growth of the middle class. I mean, we have got uh, people uh, sort of living in the middle of the pyramid in Africa between, what, 
2.1 dollars a day and uh, 20 dollars a day we have got about 330 million people and they constitute the middle of the pyramid that has been driving some of the domestic demand that you see uh, which has supported this growth uh, and of course on the external front i mean uh, we do expect that the, the the natural resource boom has also been supportive to this growth of 5.2 percent that you see uh, that, 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 that is true so so it's both internal and external but macroeconomic management and guiding these economies uh, guiding policy has been critical and the ARC has been the suppliers of the human capital uh, for, for, for this purpose. Uh, uh, but let's see how they perform as we go through the risk of QE tapering and other such, such things. But I, I think they will, they will, they will, they will fare well. Uh, of course, I must say that the shock absorbers uh, are where, where, you know, eroded uh, during the height of the crisis. Uh, uh, but I'm certain that they, they will again weather uh, the storm, at least uh, uh, do the right, the, 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 the right thing. Um, already we see the impact of QE tapering in South Africa, where the run has been quite volatile uh, uh, in sympathy with every other emerging market, India, Turkey, uh, you know, and, and, and so forth, Argentina, the, the peso. Uh, and of course, uh, you, know, you, you can see the, the, the uh, for instance, Ghana has is, is been exposed uh, quite, uh, quite a bit with the city uh, collapsing. And, and the budget deficit is in the current account position, uh, showing those Im uh, unhealthy uh, you know, imbalances that, 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 that need, need to be fixed. But they will be fixed, they will be fixed. So we can already see the impact of, of QE on some of the African countries, just, just to mention a few. Uh, but I've no doubt they'll, they'll rise to, 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 to the occasion. Well, well, in terms of the, the Africa uh, that uh, we see in the next 50 years, Certainly, the, the African leaders have an aspiration, and it is an aspiration that uh, uh, myself personally and my department in the bank uh, assisted in crafting, uh, which is a vision in 2063 of a continent that is prosperous, that is at peace with itself, uh, that is uh, integrated, uh, and other such you know, glowing words. Uh, but of course here, uh, what we mean is that fragility, post, uh, conflict w will be dealt with, should, should be dealt with. Regional integration should be accelerated and must be made more broad. Uh, it should go beyond goods and services. It's about movement of people. It's about movement of capital. It's about regional institutions of excellence in, in education. It's about building regional institutions for dealing with conflict. You know, regional institutions of governance, like you know, uh, IGAD in East Africa, or indeed echo us or whatever, strengthening them to deal with, with, with fragility. So, so, so really we, 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 we have this aspiration, a vision of, of Africa. Uh, 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 but, but also we, we, we're not the drivers of change. Uh, you know, let, me, let me say this. If, if Africa is going to grow, let's say, at about 4.5%, which is plausible, in the next 50 years, the GDP will move from something like $2 trillion uh, dollars about what, 15 trillion. GDP per capita will move from the current just under 2,000, about $2,000 per person to about uh, 6,000. It's still less than South Korea, by the way. Even now, it's still less than that, but we're talking 50s. And, and, and that's really you know, conservative 4.5%. Uh, uh, chances are uh, growth will be a, a lot higher, higher, higher than that. Uh, the population of Africa will uh, rise by an additional 1 billion people from the current 2 billion uh, 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 to, to, sorry, current just over a, a, a billion to, to just over a two, two billion uh, people with a very young uh, population. Uh, population growth is expected to be of the order of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ju 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 just below uh, two, two, two percent. Now, 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 so that, that's in Africa that we, we will emerge uh, and juxtapose that with the aspiration I talked about earlier, the vision and so forth, and how Africa is doing now. Uh, it's quite clear that to, to, to do better than the vision or really to realize the vision, we have to deal with some of the drivers of change, uh, some of the things that are really going to, to drive Africa going forward. The first issue is the infrastructure deficit which we know is of the order of $50 billion a year, which goes unfunded every, every year. And that is holding back African growth by as much as 3% of GDP. So it's very costly. 
so, so that's, that's something that needs to be done. We need to invest in infrastructure. And number two is the whole issue of urbanization. Currently, uh, you know, 65% uh, of Africans live in the rural areas, and the, and, and the remainder is, is, is in the urban areas. So, so, and this is going to change significantly, significantly. Uh, so, so dealing with it, realizing that uh, uh, the urban areas are sources of, the, of growth. They are creating the, the GDP, frankly, that, that, that you see. Uh, uh, dealing with that, the infrastructure challenges and, and all of that that comes with urbanization is an issue. The third issue is institutions, uh, building, strengthening and building institutions, institutions for, for service uh, uh, delivery, and that I'm including governance institutions. We still have, you know, from time to time, an explosion here and there, South Sudan. Please forgive South Sudan, it's a young nation. Uh, they, they, they'll, get, they'll get it together for one day. But uh, well, one day, but uh, if Mali, there are other issues uh, that, that need to be dealt with there, and, and it's, a, it's a complex issue. It's a complex issue. It's going to do with inclusion, social inclusion, and, and, and all, 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 all those things, and building uh, social cohesion. Uh, to, uh, I, th I think Africa will get there. The other driver of change is going to be climate change. Uh, it's not just about global warming. Climate change in Africa is a source of fragility. Some of the issues you, you hear in the Sahel region have to do with the encroaching desert. People are running out of water, running out of living space, uh, no water for their animals. It creates social pressure, and that could be a, a cause of fragility apart from other things. So it just goes beyond uh, you know, a 2% rise in temperature around the world to something more, more real on a day-to-day -day basis in, in, in terms of, of survival. Um, I've already talked about the issue of dealing with fragility, strengthening institutions for, for combating fragilities uh, in, 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 in the region. The, the, those, those are issues that are still to be, to be dealt with. On regional integration, I've already referred to the need to broaden uh, what we understand by regional integration into movement of goods, movement of talent, movement of capital, movement of people, institutions of excellence uh, uh, you know, um, in the region. The, on, on, I talked about the one billion people being added to the African population in the next uh, 50 years. Uh, uh, the, the half of those, at least, are young people. There is a, a big issue around developing skills, youth and skills development. So uh, tilting the education agenda towards more vocational education, producing more job-ready uh, uh, youth out of the schooling system, or indeed uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, for, for that matter, it is critical to re recognize in Africa that that's something that, that needs to be done. I can assure you, every government in Africa has woken up to this. You speak to every government, they're all thinking youth employment. How, what, what, what should we do about this? This is a driver of change, a challenge, but also an opportunity. And finally, natural resource management. Every other, other country in Africa I know has something underground. It is very valuable. It's natural resources, oil and gas, and a range of other, other minerals, are, are frankly, including the, the areas around the sea, uh, the continental shelf, and all of that. So, so managing this natural resource, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, natural resource boom is critical. The, the, the figures that we have, uh, uh, that the, the current value of natural resources in Africa, which have just been discovered you know, up to the end of last year, is of the order of $800 billion. Uh, dollars. So that's already, what is that? Is that uh, 30, another 30% of GDP, current GDP or something? I'm trying to work it out quickly. So, so it's, it's significant. And, and managing these, these resources in terms of negotiating a fairer contracts, uh, transparent contracts, the governance of that, the whole natural resource governance issue, and then uh, putting in place transparent means for managing the revenues from that, uh, your sovereign wealth funds transparently managed and well managed, and there are already good cases in Africa uh, as to where this is being done. Your Botswana is, 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 a, is a good example. I'm just mentioning one. Uh, in fact, one of the best world, sovereign wealth funds uh, in terms of management in the world is in Botswana, by the way. So, so uh, and then uh, thinking through about how you use these natural resources in terms of building infrastructure for, for education places, training, rebuilding human capital. These are some of the drivers of change, and I think that the, the, one of the roles of the ARC is in thinking about the collaborative research themes and so forth, is really attacking these, these issues from different angles because these are the drivers of change. That's what will deliver an Africa that Africans desire for themselves, that I think the world desire of Africa too, which is prosperous, less poor, at peace with itself, and well integrated. And I see ARC at the core of this delivery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Professor Hadid. 
Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, to give you a sense of what I found outside of the research world when I stepped into the current position where I've served, now this is my seventh year as a central bank governor. There are three good things that I saw uh, virtually immediately. First one is that when ARC began, one of the main goals that we had was to see whether we can localize the capacity for policy making. That was the time, 88, 89, 90, when uh, uh, most of our programs were actually uh, developed outside of the country. Um, and typically, whatever was called negotiation was just a process of uh, agreeing uh, or accepting what was being uh, developed elsewhere. One thing I saw when I arrived in the policy world was actually that uh, that change had taken place. Uh, programs are not drawn from outside. Uh, and actually, uh, it's the local capacity to a very large extent, which now gets engaged in the preparation uh, of the policy frameworks uh, that govern countries. Um, in that respect, uh, having in between uh, my ARC days and uh, uh, the current position having served in the, in the World Bank, uh, I saw clearly what that difference meant. And, uh, and I think uh, this is one thing that uh, I must say uh, has almost, can be considered almost revolutionary by any standards. Even those now that are coming to work with us, like the International Growth Center, um, actually they work with us to develop uh, exactly the policy frameworks that we, uh, uh, to start with, have uh, uh, thought through and we work uh, at par and as colleagues. And this, I think, is uh, extremely, extremely um, satisfying. Second, I found the bulk of the workhorse of policy analysis really as uh, products of ARC, where I am. Um, we have, at the Bank of Tanzania, we have about uh, 15 PhDs uh, in the central bank in terms of economics, uh, maybe about uh, eight to 10 of those are actually uh, ARC graduates. And uh, those that with uh, masters and other graduate uh, degrees, well, most of them, again, are uh, ARC graduates. And the impressive quality of the work that they do uh, is partly what, again, has given me uh, a lot of comfort. And it is not because I used to be in, in ARC. Uh, I'm saying this partly because they actually stand toe to toe with those that have gone to the best schools. Uh, and uh, the good thing is that uh, contextually, uh, they are well informed and hence uh, making uh, the supportive work for policy uh, analysis and policy making uh, much more um, robust. Third is the power of ARC research networking that I also have come to appreciate in my job. I'll give you an episode. In 2011, in Eastern uh, Africa, we had uh, a currency attack simultaneously in all our uh, five, six countries. Uh, fortunately, uh, the governors 
uh, of central banks of all the, uh, the five countries uh, have met in the context of uh, uh, ARC network. We trusted each other. Um, and we could uh, very clearly depend on each other's experience without raising doubts. Um, so the transactions cost of simply determining whether to trust or not to trust, those were totally out of uh, um, the context. And therefore, um, we coordinated our, our uh, policy interventions uh, with our teams of uh, uh, experts, again, who are part of the network, who knew each other. And therefore, that trust wasn't just at the leadership level, but also at the uh, technical level. And we were able, actually, to uh, win that fight. It wasn't easy. It needed coordination. That coordination was facilitated uh, simply by the fact that uh, uh, we were one network, um, Esprit de Corps, uh, with the Esprit de Corps that um, was unquestionable, and uh, we could have trust amongst um, each other. Uh, now, I, I just used much more localized examples just to give you a sense. When you scale that up to the level that uh, 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 Lema has, uh, 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 has described for the whole region, uh, it definitely uh, accounts uh, for a, a much more potent uh, knowledge exchange and uh, definitely in terms of uh, uh, implementation. So I, I wanted really to um, uh, highlight those three and then just close with um, one major challenge that uh, uh, I see the new context of policy making has uh, brought to the fore. Um, policy making is much more competitive now across constituencies within, the, within any of our countries. Um, Evidence has tended to strengthen the position of anyone who wants to have uh, successful um, uh, uh, uptake of their position. And therefore, um, it is not only um, important that uh, uh, ARC learns to work with government in terms of policy making, but ARC has now to work with a wide, much wider range of uh, constituencies uh, for policy making in the country. And part of that is um, through working with uh, uh, knowledge intermediaries, which are national entities, such as policy think tanks, that uh, interpret fairly complex knowledge and make it available to a much wider range of, um, um, uh, of uh, uh, policy interested groups. So um, in that context, uh, part of the challenge of ARC uh, in terms of uh, making research meet uh, uh, policy is uh, to ensure that it's uh, able to make that knowledge available to a much wider range uh, of policy interested groups in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we open up for, for, for questions, we'd like to turn to uh, Professor Kenneth Pruitt, also a member of the board. Uh, he's Vice President uh, for Global Centers and Carnegie Professor for Public Affairs at Columbia University. Um, you're, you're welcome to stand up or? Um... Oh, oh, great, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> If you press the button. Yeah. Um, I, uh, over 25 years ago, uh, AERC existed, but it existed as a program of the IDRC, a Canadian AID agency, as many of you know. Um, uh, it had as its director um, a member of the IDRC staff, and Benno was the director of research. 
And then for various reasons, it became important to shift this to a different venue and the Rockefeller Foundation stepped forward. I was then the vice president of Rockefeller Foundation, senior vice president, managing lots of stuff, including all of the Africa program. And so I was approached about whether this made sense. And so I was part of the founding, which in effect means that uh, Benno hired me as his first board chairman. Um, and uh, it wasn't because I knew anything or had anything to say, but I had a checkbook. Um, and I, 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 uh, I, I hope, Benno, you think that was one of your better hires. Uh, uh, um, yeah. So it's, it's an enormous uh, uh, pleasure in many ways to, to follow Benno uh, to, to, to the mic. Look, here's the situation. What he said is true. This institution has been an enormous success at capacity building. Uh, there is nothing else like it on the continent and not many things like it on any other continent. Um, uh, I can tell you the foundation world at that time, um, uh, 25 years ago, was frustrated because they could not get headway. The only way you can make any kind of headway is move people at a huge expense uh, from Africa uh, to U.S. universities, give them PhDs and hope they go back and so forth and so on. It was not a good situation and AERC in the field of economics corrected that situation with an extremely important uh, uh, coalition, if you will, of, of in universities in which you could move students around, move courses around and so forth. So the underlying mechanism was a capacity building mechanism and it worked and it's a huge success. It still needs to be done and they're still doing it. However, and this is my point, uh, the world's a different world today. And the question, as we all know, is, well, what have you done for us lately? <laughs> and uh, we swim in a sea of, um, of, of impact and performance measures uh, and, and, and prove your worth. Uh, why invest in you until we know that you are making a difference and, and every think tank in Washington uh, knows uh, what, that, uh, what that, that swimming pool feels like. Um, so, so what I was asked to do was come back on the board and be sort of an irritant on, on, on this question uh, and I've, I've, I've done so. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say successfully, but certainly I've been an irritant. Uh, and this is my last shot at it. I'm about to go off the board, so I'm about to be an irritant yet again. Um, the, um, it turns out that the social science community does not understand anything about impact. Uh, in 1978, the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, created a committee, wrote a report called Knowledge and Policy, the Uncertain con uh, Connection. 1978, heavy day, right? Doing uh, uh, social experiments doing, um, in, in the United States, doing uh, uh, think tanks are growing weekly. A uh, huge amount of money is pouring in. We're getting good at all kinds of things. So uh, the Academy said, let's take a look at how's it, how's it going? Policy schools, the whole business. And here is what the National Academy of Sciences said in 1978. Although the need for large-scale federal support for social R&D is widely accepted, questions concerning its relevance to the making of social policy have become more insistent. What are we learning? Who is making use of what we know? Um, I, I, I call that the big wine. We know so much, why in the world aren't they paying attention to us? And here is what was concluded in 1978. Unfortunately, we lack systematic evidence as to whether these steps are having the results their sponsors hope for. The uncertain connection in the title was not uncertain about whether it was happening, but uncertain about how and why and how much and so forth. We knew we were having an impact. We, could, we had anecdotes, endless anecdotes. So, um, so, good, 1978, 35 years later, National Academy says, look, so much has happened. We have evidence-based policy, we have evidence hierarchies, we have randomized field control trials, which have now moved to Africa in a major, major way. Uh, we have translation research, uh, we have intermediaries, 
we have typologies of use, all starting with Carol Weiss and, and Limbloom and Cohen and that literature and the knowledge uh, utilization literature that grew up and so forth. So let's take a new, new look and sort of see what we now know about the use, the impact of our research. And this uh, committee, uh, I, I, I have to say, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but it's true, I, I, I wrote it. Uh, I chaired it, but that's not the point, but I would feel awkward if you picked it up and found out I had and I hadn't mentioned it. Um, I, I'm obviously not selling it. It's free. <laughs> so, uh, so, but, uh, uh, so uh, group 15, standard National Academy of Science uh, apparatus, spread across, very, very smart people, uh, uh, struggled with this question. Spent over $2 million went on and on for five or six years, sent it out for review, came back and said, rewrite it. It really is a hard question. And we concluded the same thing that was concluded in 1978. We actually don't have a social science of the use of science, not just the use of social science, but the use of science. We have anecdotes, we have stories to tell, but we don't have anything systematic. Now, let me stop there and say this brings me back then to, to AERC. Um, it is simply not true, this, according to this report, that just getting the science better and better and better, you know, better methodologies, uh, better theoretical constructs and so forth, and just communicating it more clearly results in use. We say that to ourselves because that's what we know how to do. We know how to get it right and we know how to try to communicate it clearly. But just learning that does not answer the question of will it be used? I don't have time, I obviously will stop in just a few minutes, I don't want to go through this report. But what we, dis what we discovered is that what we don't have a, is a social science that looks at the use problem from the inside out. We have a lot of stuff, knowledge typologies and evidence, blah, 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 about looking at the process from the outside, trying to look in, and guessing about what's going on inside that system. And that's odd, because sometimes we're in that system ourselves, as people like Benno and, and our chair is, and so forth. We're back and forth across these systems. But nevertheless, we have not figured out a way in which to understand the flow uh, of, of what we know. And we know it's used, but we, it's, it's amazing. Now, uh, so here's one short, short version. Of, of, of the finding, uh, and I'll, I have two, I'll give you the first one. It is not evidence-based policy. It is evidence-influenced politics. Policy comes from politics. It doesn't just descend from agencies. It comes out of a political process. And if the evidence influences the political process, then it will have a, a handle on how to actually influence the policy. So it's a, it, you think about it, you know, and that sounds kind of simple-minded, but think more about it, <laughs> because it is not simple. It's a fundamentally different way of thinking about it. Secondly, the use of research in the policy process is itself a social process, which means has all the characteristics of how groups make decisions. By the way, you're not individual decision makers almost ever. It's always a group arguing back and forth, and what about this trade-off and that compromise and so forth and so on. And it's political, it's ideological, it has to be. We live in democracies, they're supposed to be political and ideological and so forth and so on. So we now have a phenomena which is necessarily a social phenomena. Not just the use of social science, but the use of engineering, the use of physics, the use of math, the use of chemistry, we don't care what it is. Once it is being used, it is a social phenomena. It has to be understood by social scientists. And, and uh, one of the things we say is it, we need real help from behavioral economics. The behavioral economics is really thick into how we make decisions, how do groups make group dy dynamics and decision making and so forth and so on. So the, 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 the really good news, and this is what I leave you with, this institution, which has figured out how to create serious capacity to do intellectual work on the continent of Africa, is now going to take up this question. They've actually made real headway.
They've created new kinds of mechanisms that go beyond the mechanisms we have here, as a matter of fact. He's senior policy, and I won't do the details. Go beyond what we've done here. And I actually think their position, uh, factoid, if you ask yourself how many economists on the continent of Africa, in you know, World Bank and, and uh, Development Bank, uh, African Development Bank and universities and so forth, about how many really important ones are that sort of are in a position to take uh, research and translate it into to, to effective policies. The estimate is somewhere between 500 and 1,000. Over 100 of those are alums of AERC. If it's only 500, we're 20% of the way there. <laughs> you know, we've already... Anyway, my point is stay tuned because on the continent of Africa, uh, this is institution which is now saying we've got to go beyond capacity building, we've got to take the next step and figure out how do we understand whether what they know will be used and what goes on in the use process, and that itself becomes a, a focus of analytic attention. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Um, uh, maybe I can start a, a first question. Um, following on that, in terms of what is kind of what is the demand signal you get from policymakers in, in terms of does that. It, is that what influences what you choose to focus focus on? Um, the second one was um, the question of the private sector, um, you know, uh, uh, which we hope becomes more and more of a driver going forward, but is probably equally in need of, of um, research in terms of the trade-offs and so forth. And I wonder what what your strategy, what you're thinking in terms of strategy of engaging um, the private sector um, is on that. Finally, links perhaps with U.S. institutions and others. I just want to wondered if, if that's if that's part of or, or global in, or institutions more globally. That's three questions, so I'm sorry about that. Should we take a couple uh, to, and then come back to the panel and we'll just run, run down? Or do you, why don't you take that first set and uh, we'll perhaps address that? So these are very interesting uh, uh, questions. Um, one really has to do with uh, how, do you, how do you go about designing uh, policy-oriented research. Uh, it's really, um, it's not that it's straight. Uh, we do it um, first uh, on our own volition, what we think uh, would be um, important and become proactive. But, but second is what I said earlier. Uh, we have a senior policy seminar where we attract um, governors of central banks, Ministers of Finance, and also senior level uh, policymakers, where we dialogue on collaborative research that is done by the ARC uh, network. The network includes African researchers, global resource persons outside Africa as well on, on big issues. And uh, in that uh, setting, what we are trying to do is to kind of influence conversation about a cutting edge issue of policy. And then in that process, we also become guided by them, going back and then revisit. Um, the second approach is, is that ARC has been an institution which has been evaluated and re-evaluated. In fact, one of the things that I have difficulty is keeping track of how many evaluations have actually gone through. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively new, <laughs> right? And in fact, uh, uh, right now, we have actually undergone through four evaluations. We have thematic research, which is the, one, the framework I, I described earlier, the entire strategy of ARC. So what, what these evaluations are actually uh, helping us is, again, guiding. Uh, we have uh, Steve O'Connell in our audience. Uh, he and uh, uh, a World Bank economist actually looked at this them thematic research. Again, based on conversations, a variety of stakeholders, they came up with a menu of suggestions, one of which is actually revisiting the entire thematic uh, research area. So that's how, uh, how we actually, uh, so it's really like feedbacks back and forth. Um, now, the private sector agenda, um, it's not going to be just for its own sake. Uh, there are very important issues uh, of uh, mutual interest uh, take, for instance, uh, like smallholder farmers. You know, people do not seem to appreciate that's the private sector. And, and uh, we have a training program 
that actually uh, addresses both research and training uh, related issues regarding smallholder uh, farmers. And then take, for instance, finance. You know, we, uh, both in research and training, you know, issues of like risk management, governance, financial regulation, uh, are very relevant in terms of um, impacting our research agenda. They're also very relevant in the training arena. Uh, in order, so it's for, for instance, if, for, if you take a financial institution, which is incapable of conducting appropriate credit risk analysis, it is bound to make distorted choices and decisions. That will distort economic performance. It aggregates into economic performance. So, so, so having like talented financial manpower, not only through the efforts of the public sector, also the private sector. And then, and then also in the senior policy seminars that I mentioned, and also national workshops, we will have a conglomeration, a mix of private sector actors. Uh, so in the plenary conference that I mentioned earlier, where we begin the entire biennial, last time we decided to have one on financial inclusion and innovation. What we did this time was not just policymakers coming from the public sector, but also private sector actors dialoguing on the issue of financial inclusion, because we think that financial inclusion is important and becomes an input this, this conversation that's going on in Africa about inclusive growth. You know, it's, it's African growth syndrome, which is very, very impressive. You now the jury is still out on inclusive growth. By the way, as a footnote, I must say that uh, one of the factors of production of this growth syndrome is informed policy making. So this thing is not accidental. And ARC has been there for the last 25 years. Those guys are all over. So I, I haven't done like an empirical evidence, but I know that that's, that's an important factor. On, uh, on linkages, um, this is something that we are going to do more of it moving forward, but uh, uh, our approach is one of very deep African perspective with best global practices. And so we have actually uh, concluded that the, the, the kinds of things that we can do to move Africa forward depends those who are, say, in North America, Europe, Brazil, or China, who have interest, actually leveraging the talent that's on the ground. And I, I, I came to appreciate that when, uh, when um, uh, somebody made an announcement of my appointment at the University of Maryland. The, the group that showed a lot of interest was the School of Public Policy. And it turned out that there are a number of those guys who really, really are very eager to do cutting edge research on Africa, but they are kind of handicapped with data. They don't have linkages. So, so it's, so it's north-south, south-south uh, linkages is one of the things that we are going to push into our next strategy. We are actually in the process of getting our next strategy 2015, 2020. Thank you. Uh, Bob Berg, um, I was senior advisor of the Economic Commission for Africa for 10 years when we tried to work hard with AERC very successfully. Two questions uh, picking up from Ken and, and this discussion uh, dealing with uh, capacities. One is based on the rebasing of uh, GDP in Ghana and now shortly in Nigeria, bringing us to realize again that basic statistical services are not strong. And uh, so therefore, research costs a lot more to do to pull up statistics that others should be doing as a public service. Wondering whether AERC has recommendations about how to get more focus on that. And secondly, um, I chaired, founded and chaired the DAC group on evaluation and tried to persuade my colleagues, not very successfully, that evaluation of development assistance belonged in host government. And um, now there are some small movements in that direction, but uh, certainly in Tanzania, it's always been a case study that, oh, of, of the donors tripping over each other, taking up enormous amounts of government time uh, to study the government's development. And uh, is there uh, an idea of how one could rationalize this? and place more focus 
on home country research and home country governance. Hi, Connie Freeman. I am um, a professor at Syracuse University now, but I'm delighted to be here today to see my colleagues from AERC. I too was a board member at one point of AERC when I was the regional director for IDRC in Nairobi. And we worked very closely together for a 10-year period, and Dr. Ndulu kindly spoke at our 40th anniversary, so it's a great pleasure to be here. I was struck, as you all were speaking, that within the US, where I now live and work and teach, there's an increasing awareness of the economic opportunities in Africa, of greatly improved growth rates, but I don't think there is a full appreciation of the increase in the talent pool, which you mentioned and you exemplify sitting there nor is there the level of respect for that talent pool that will be extremely necessary if we're going to work together more creatively and get over this idea that the West still should be instructing Africa. A second comment is, as you discuss the business about policy and research, and reflecting on my time with IDRC, there were two elements that I thought were particularly relevant and we worked on hard at that time. One you talked about in detail, it's called networking, and that's what IDRC provides as a network. And the other is actually communications. It's how do you present the research to the policymaker? Because if they can't digest it, they can't use it. And academics tend to present research in undigestible fashion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Gail Martin, um, World Bank. Um, together with the ARC, the bank, the World Bank and the African um, Development Bank uh, are partners in this initiative that uh, Alema uh, mentioned uh, called the Service Delivery Indicators. And I just want to maybe mention that for those who are not familiar with the AARC and their network, is that uh, we conduct surveys in schools and health facilities uh, um, across Africa. And in each country, the implementation model is where an affiliate of, of the AARC, whether it's in Kenya, the Kenya Institute of Public Policy Research, or in Uganda, the Economic Policy Research Center, Tanzania, uh, Senegal, et cetera, these are all talent that's on the ground that makes it possible for us to run an Africa-wide program. And um, it's also talent with credibility uh, in, uh, on the ground. And um, in the bank, we always talk about the convening power of the bank. Quite frankly, I'm riding on the tails or coattails of the convening power of the ARC, and a more specific, maybe not in the name of ARC, but certainly in the name of those research institutes on the ground. And I, and I think that um, this makes this initiative a really powerful model because often it is said that when you do surveys, you are replacing a, a, a mechanism that should be built in government information systems. And I, and I want to offer the, 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 the notion that research, uh, s surveys like, uh, that collect this kind of information on quality uh, cannot always be uh, generated through inform routine information systems because you need a third party opinion to assess quality. So, um, I, I, and I, the partnership with ARC and, and uh, the African Development Bank, uh, I look forward to that and also welcome you to go to the SDI website. Thanks. Well, it's the approach of the ARC on the issue of statistics, which is important, is really one of collaboration with other institutions. Uh, <clears throat> for a start, the ARC, ARC has been running this database now on uh, the agricultural sector. I mean, then I can give more, more, more detail working with the World Food Program. 
on uh, uh, farmers, African farmers, and, and, and so forth. Now, uh, now the, the, the thing is like this, the, 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 there'll be collaboration between the ARC and, um, and the uh, African Development Bank. The AFDB has uh, been investing in statistics uh, 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 capacity uh, building for the last uh, four years very aggressively. Uh, we've been able to connect, uh, I would say now about uh, 30 to 35 statistics bureaus in Africa to one statistical hub. This is called the African uh, Information Highway. And that is what uh, is being made available to the researchers of ARC. Most of the data consists of macroeconomic data. Uh, and recently we've agreed that with the, with the IMF that from now on the, the, the African Development Bank is going to collect the data on Africa and pass it on to the IMF. Uh, uh, of course, after that, it will be branded IMF data, which is fine with us. Uh, but the idea is then is really one of collaborating with the ARSC so that this data can be utilized for, for research. So I, I agree that capacity development uh, in statistics is very critical, uh, but it costs a lot of money. And I don't think that it is the ARSC that's going to pay for it. It's, it's the people like the African Development Bank, the World Bank, will pay for it. But really, it's for use by researchers uh, for, of the ARC uh, network in order to inform uh, policy. I, I must add this, this uh, uh, program is really advanced. I mean, if you get into the system, it will just, uh, it's mind blowing. You can do anything on that data platform. It's incredible. And we've moved on to a position now where we can start collecting data by mobile phone. I actually did a trial personally in Tunisia where I was able to sample uh, uh, 20,000 uh, uh, people in one hour uh, in terms of youth employment. And we did another survey in Congo DRC who we were able to survey uh, uh, basically half a million uh, people uh, in five hours, uh, all by SMS-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, Q&A, uh, you know, requesting uh, responses on that and questionnaires. So, 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 yeah, so it's collaboration. It costs a lot of money. It's really all hands on deck, uh, but, but it's important. We just need better data. But also what's required, I think, is some repository on, on specialized data, let's say, on, on unemployment, the agricultural sector that I talked about, uh, Lemma can say more about that, uh, and then uh, uh, on gender issues, on service delivery. So just data on that, what uh, Gail Martin was still speaking about. So, so, but also household surveys, so that then the macro data could begin to be, uh, you know, to be tallied, or at least to speak to the micro data. So both micro and macro need to be somewhere where it can be accessed, but it should always be, be, be improved. Well, we, we, we did assist uh, Ghana on the rebasing of their GDP figures. We did the peer, peer review, and by the way, every, uh, 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 every, every, in fact, every year continuously, we produce what is called a, 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 stat a statistical quality survey and ranking of all African countries. It's a public document, I can share that with you. We, we rank, I can tell you, number one is South Africa, followed by Mauritius, da, 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 all, all the way down. We, I've, we've got the ranking, and, and we tell the country, this is where you are ranked now, you need to improve, but of course, everything is relative. So, 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 I mean, that's a long answer to a, to a, a, a very a sh sh short question. Maybe, uh, yeah, this idea of uh, how to present a, po a policy brief that uh, 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 Freeman uh, talked about, it, 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 this, is, this is important. It's, it's an art. It's an art. Just making sure that the, the heading of the two-page policy brief communicates a message. And the idea that the... You, if you are putting this together, you must put yourself in the shoes of the policymaker. What is his or her problem? What problem are they grappling with uh, politically, uh, their fears? What is it? And then trying to work out how the, the, the research is then going to inform or deal or be a solution for that problem. It has to speak directly. Uh, I must say that I'm always struck when I speak to the Center for Global Development how they do it with their one-pagers. Uh, I'm very impressed, actually. Speak to uh, uh, them. They, 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 they've got a few tricks as how to do this, where they, they spend a lot of time researching the, literally the mind of the policymaker. What are their fears? What are their concerns? And you start from there in terms of, you already have your research, it's in the back pocket, but in terms of framing it uh, to them, uh, it's important to know how they think and the politics that they are subjected to, which Ken, Ken was, uh, was talking about, about earlier. Um, let me just stop here. I think my colleagues.
answer on the communication, I mean, it's something we grapple with, um, kind of translating, uh, you know, you can get things taken up by a technocratic cadre, but, but not necessarily from the people who decide on policy. And so you do have to reach also a, a broader audience than just even the government, I think, and getting media, um, getting, getting pub moving public opinion and understanding. I wonder, uh, uh, Professor Ndulu, would you like to say something on that? And from having sat in both the trying to communicate and... <laughs> Well, I, I, I wanted just to speak to the uh, question of uh, evaluation being, being uh, done um, uh, as an in-country. Uh, you know, un unfortunately, uh, Bob, on that score, I think we are moving backwards. Um, we had gone to a point where either through general budget support framework or aid coordination framework. We had um, set up a framework for uh, doing joint evaluation with uh, development partners. Um, and at some stage, uh, even to have an independent evaluation of both parties, like uh, the Halina independent type uh, report, um, giving scores on both sides in terms of what they had committed to do and uh, whether or not they did. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we're moving away from both of those. Uh, I know for sure in Tanzania, independent evaluation disappeared about uh, three years ago. No, about four years ago. Uh, and now, uh, general budget support it's disappearing, so evaluations will go back to the silos in each one of the sectors. So we'll have again, uh, most likely, most likely, um, uh, evaluations being done uh, on the basis of uh, provision of support in various uh, places. Um, and this is happening despite Paris uh, and rhetoric moving in the opposite direction. So some of us are struggling with that just to see what, what went wrong. But uh, this is, I think, what's, what's happening. I'm sorry I don't have uh, uh, much better uh, news on that. We are struggling with that. Some of us are trying to see whether we can at least salvage the evaluation part, even if uh, money starts flowing uh, in the old ways. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to see how you keep that uh, without the reward of putting money together. So uh, I think it will be another Nobel uh, Prize uh, for somebody to come up with, with that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there was a, a question regarding uh, database, uh, and then there was a mention of uh, uh, data on uh, agriculture. And I want to say a couple of words uh, about that. Uh, maybe as a preamble, I think Matuli is correct that uh, ARC uh, does partner with the menu of institutions, you know, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, UNU, wider universities, and so on. So uh, WFP, as you know, has a pretty huge purchasing power. And so they have this program called Purchase for Progress. Basically, they buy from small holder farmers. And there have been um, data gathered at country offices. So they came and actually partnered with ARC on uh, data uh, uh, basically cleaning and analyzing and reporting. And so uh, what we're doing now is actually uh, using it for two purposes. One is that uh, uh, we can actually ha we have an opportunity, an infrastructure for a data repository, not only in agriculture, but also in non-agriculture. We haven't done that in the past. Uh, and, and also, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we go through evaluation and reviews, we revisit what we do. And when we went back and looked at our five of our teams, like poverty, income distribution, macroeconomic policies, regional integration, finance, and so on, 
uh, we, now we're actually, uh, in the next strategy, we are going to have a focused team on agriculture. And I think that the, this WFP database uh, partnership is going to be very useful, and we're going to actually get this uh, uh, connected with the network. This brings back, back uh, uh, one message about ARC. We are a vast network, a network of researchers, resource people, policy makers, and um, the organization has become uh, a little bit complex. Sometimes I have difficulty communicating it. And the first uh, attempt that I tried to communicate to my friends in the U.S. was with uh, Jim Poterba, who is the NBR president. And so I had a meeting with him. You know, he had gone to the website and then he said, you know, what is this? Uh, is this NBR? And I said, yeah, it's NBR, but it's not just NBR. Then is it Brookings? Yeah, it's Brookings, but it's not just Brookings. <laughs> How about NSF? Yeah, it's NSF, but it's not just NSF. So we have a very complex organization, which is, which is kind of a combination of Brookings, NSF, and NBR. And, 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 um, and it's very difficult to replicate. <laughs> so um, what, uh, and, and as a result of that, there has been communication gap uh, between the research guys and the training guys. And, and also, not only outside Africa, also within Africa. So we actually embarked in the area of uh, very important communication strategy, really communicating ARC. That's what we're doing currently. And, um, uh, and even take, take it, actually, we, we then recognize that, uh, like we do in this country, there is an opportunity to have an alumni organization. So now we have uh, alumni from Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, CSAE, Oxford University, actually partnering great momentum. They're going to come. I was an announcement. So, so as we reduce communication gap, as we create more synergy uh, uh, and, and for greater value, what we are seeing as emerging is very powerful unified voice for African development. I'm, I'm very, very, very excited about that. And I'm going to end with that. Thank you. Um, actually, we are a little over time, in fact, yeah. so I'm, I'm afraid for the last two we're not able to um, uh, uh, take those, but, you know, I think maybe you can. We are going to show, uh, I don't know, will we show, uh, uh, we'll take a, a quick break, but we'll show a, a small, uh, short five-minute clip of a, of a film on AERC. If you're not able to stay, though, uh, we've webcasted this event. It will be on our website, and we'll also put a link to, to the film. Um, and we'll be sending that uh, kind of a synopsis out to the whole um, invitation list. Um, so uh, with that, I want to I want to thank um, uh, all of our panelists and the AERC, um, A, for coming to CSIS and, and sharing that with us. And uh, I hope we can serve as a platform for communication of some of your pre research going forward. So we'd love to do that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.